I want to share this little story that happened to me where I can kind of just test and gauge the audience in here to see what type of person you are. Um, this happened to me when I was a student pastor, probably back 2013. I was coming to Bible study every Wednesday night. We had something called rap session. We would all get together and we would chop it up. How was your week? How are you representing the kingdom? What scriptures could we memorize to be better Christians? And this particular um, Wednesday, I was heading to church and my gas light came on. And so I'm like, cool, you know, it just came on. I could make it to church. You know, my car stopped <laughs> on 1960. I had to get out. It had to be supernatural strength. I'm not exaggerating this. I got out the car and pushed it up a hill with my hand on the steering wheel. I feel kind of strong after that. <laughs> and so it makes me ask this question. When your gas light comes on, letting you know that you are on fumes, which one are you? Are you A, you immediately pull over, B, I've been here before, I'm good, or C, I'm going to get to my destination first? Any A people, as soon as it come on, you pull over, okay? It comes on, I've been here before, I'm going to make it. So that's most of us. <laughs> All right, C, I'm going to get there first, and after I leave, then I'm going to stop and get it. So we have more B and C in the room. <laughs> so we got some risk takers. <laughs> I know my car. Somebody said, I know my car. I've been here before. <laughs> I know how Betsy do. I know she can get me there. This, this is what I wonder. I wonder has that perspective bled over into your spiritual life? What do you do when your spiritual tank lets you know, bing, I'm on fumes? Do you immediately get in your closet and cause for your flame to get brewed back up? Do you like, you know what? I'm all right. At least I'm saved. God ain't through with me yet. Or are you an individual that just coast in your Christianity? Just coast. God loves me. He knows my heart. The only person that could judge me is God. Like that scripture, that's Tupac Shakur. <laughs> I wonder how many people the Holy Spirit has let you know you're on fumes, but just like you are with your car, you are with your spirit. I've been here before. <laughs> your neck, your edges, it's going to get hot in here on today. Today we're starting a brand new sermon series entitled Fire Fighters. And you got one clap, and that's okay. That's okay. Heaven is clapping. Preach it, son. Yeah. Fire fighters. Because I believe there's some stuff that the Holy Spirit wants to burn up in our lives so that we can stop blaming the devil for us liking firefighters. It's not the devil. It's your habits. So I, I want to show us, we're going to go through a lot of scripture, but a foundational text for our brand new sermon series is going to take residence in Acts chapter 28. Acts chapter 28, we're going to launch our reading at verse 1. I saw something in this particular biblical text. Acts is one of my favorite books of the Bible. And I saw something that I never saw before. And I want to see if you catch it as well. Acts chapter 1, if you do not have a tangible Bible, we'll have it projected for you on the screen. Acts chapter 28, excuse me, Acts chapter 28, verse 1. If you're ready, shout as loud as you can. I'm ready. I'm ready. It says, after we were brought safely through, because they just went through a storm. We'll speak about that throughout the sermonic journey. After we were brought through safely, we then learned that the island was called Malta. The native people showed us unusual kindness. For they kindled a fire and welcomed us all because it had begun to rain and was cold. When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. When the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, no doubt this man is a murderer. Though he has escaped from the sea, justice 
has not allowed him to live. So they were on some final destination type stuff. You cheated death, it's coming back to get you. He, however, shook off the creature. Somebody say, shake it off. He shook off the viper, he shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. They were waiting for him to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. Isn't it amazing how people wait for you to fail? Like they're not trying to help, they're not trying to find medicine, they're waiting to see what's going to happen because you got bit. That's a whole other sermon. But when they had waited a long time, and saw no misfortune come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. (laughs) One moment, you're a murderer. Second moment, we're waiting for you to die. Third moment, he's a god. Why are you tripping over what people think about you? They're gonna constantly keep changing their minds. Our clause of concern, our verse of importance and where we're gonna park for the, for the remainder of our sermonic journey, I never saw this until this week. Verse 3, when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on a fire, a viper came out because of the heat. A viper came out because of the heat. A viper came out because of the heat. We have one of the most anointed apostles in the New Testament carrying a snake but doesn't know it. And the only way he's able to identify that there is a snake in here is once he puts it in fire. So I think for part one of this series, we should speak around this thought from this subject, fire exposes snakes. Fire exposes snakes. Maybe this is why the the enemy wants you to have just a spark because fire exposes snakes. You don't know that the enemy is in this relationship because both of y'all are not on fire. You don't know that God is not behind this offer because both of you are not on fire. Maybe it takes fire to expose where the enemy's hiding. Fire exposes snakes. Father God, you're awesome. Thank you for your word. Thank you for allowing us to see a new day. I say that a day that we never saw before and a day that we will never see again. Just like I prayed in private, I also declare it in public. Anoint me as your oracle. The soundtrack, the PA system of heaven, all of the study means absolutely nothing if you aren't magnified and if you aren't glorified. Father, we are asking for an all-consuming fire to consume this house. Everybody watching online, I'm praying, God, that this will start house fires. That the fire of the Holy Spirit will begin to burn in our hearts so that no longer will we have a year of casual Christianity. No longer will we have a year of smoke. No longer will we have a year of a flicker. But God set our hearts on fire. We are a people who desire the fire of God. We're asking that you do it. Breathe on our encounter. Breathe on this word. Not for ourselves, but so that you can be glorified in Jesus' name. And everybody who agrees to that prayer would just shout all over the room, Amen. 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 Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, I'm excited because today we are starting a brand new sermon series entitled Fire Fighters. Now, interwoven all throughout the fabric of Scripture, you will see fire representing and symbolic of three things. I already given you notes. They're symbolic of three things. Number one, the presence and power of God. Number two, the judgment of God. And number three, testing and trials. All throughout the fabric of Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, you will see fire representing and being symbolic of the presence and power of God or the judgment of God or testing and trials. So since this is part one, I really want you to see that I'm not just up here preaching my opinion. I wanna give you several passages of scripture where you can see this. Is it okay if I do that? All right, Matthew chapter three, verse 11. This is John the Baptist speaking about Jesus. Matthew three, verse 11, John says, listen, 
I baptize you with water for repentance. Like how we did last Sunday, baptizing the young, the old, married, unmarried. I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with what's that word? Fire. So right here, we see fire representing the power of God. Genesis chapter 19, verse 23, speaking about Sodom and Gomorrah, it says the sun had risen up upon the earth where Lot entered Zorah. Then the Lord rained brimstone, and what's that word? Fire, on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. So in this biblical narrative, we see fire as the judgment of God. Then Peter lets us know in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, Dear friends, stop tripping. Do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal, the fiery trials that has come on you to what? Test you. As though something strange were happening to you. So in this biblical narrative, we see fire is representing testing. Now, these last two passages of Scripture, Luke chapter 24, verse 49, this is after Jesus has resurrected from the grave and he's speaking to his disciples. He tells them, verse 49 of Luke 24, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Where did he tell them to wait? Y'all going to have to pay attention. Where did he tell them to wait? <laughs> Jerusalem. Okay. Now let's see when this actually happened. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. It says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Right here, we're seeing fire be the presence and the power of God. So let's put all of this together. I think oftentimes we overlook the power and potency of Luke chapter 24, verse 49, when Jesus says, all right, listen, I've defeated death, I've conquered the grave, now you need some power. Now I need to set you on fire. So what I need you to do is go tarry in Jerusalem until you get this heat, until you get this fire. Now if you know any biblical context of the day, Jerusalem was the hottest place in the world for Christians. I mean for heaven's sakes, they just killed you, Jesus. They just killed you. They oppose our message. Anybody who's preaching that Jesus is the Messiah, they're beating, they're putting in prison. Why would you tell us to go back in the fire? And it's because Jesus is like, all right, I use fire to get you on fire. <laughs> Y'all missed it. Go back there where it's hot because the fiery place is going to give your spirit some fire. You get a different level of preach once you've been in the fire. You get a different level of worship once you've been in the fire. Your praise hits a little different once you've been in the fire. Your fasting gets a little different once you get in the fire. Your praise dance is a little different once you've been in the fire. I know the place that you're at right now may be uncomfortable. Could it be? Let me shift your perspective. Maybe the reason your situation isn't changing is because you're trying to make moves, but God is trying to set you ablaze. Talk Holy Spirit. Maybe the reason your situation hasn't changed is because you're trying to make moves so that you can stunt and flex on the ground. But God's like, no, I'm trying to put fire in your heart, fill you with my Holy Spirit so that you can dismantle strongholds in your bloodline, so that you can dismantle diabolical activities in your region, in your community. I'm trying to set you on fire. I put you in fire so that you can catch on fire. This is so good, y'all. <laughs> I know it's uncomfortable, 
but Terry. I know you don't like it, but Terry. I know that you thought that your life would look different, but Terry. I know that you thought that your life would be further down the line by now, but Terry. Your placement is not by accident, it is intentional. And I know you don't like it, you prayed against it, you even tried to rebuke it, but watch this. You have been given the power to rebuke a devil and a demon, but you cannot rebuke what God is using to set you on fire. Did y'all hear what I just said? You have been given the power to rebuke a devil and a demon, but you can't rebuke the very thing that God is using to set you on fire. This is the place where your fire increases. Somebody say fire. So peradventure, could it be this is not God holding you back? This is not punishment from your former. Better yet, this is not even the devil. This is God trying to give your faith some flames. I'm trying to get you some fire. And I can't speak for anybody else, but this is what I've learned personally in my ministry tenure. It doesn't matter. You can have more degrees than a thermostat. Go before your name or behind your name. You can know how to exegete scripture with hermeneutical accuracy and, therapy and theological surgical skills. You can do all that, which is not really impressive because the devil knows the Bible. <laughs> the devil can quote scripture. The devil can exegete a passage of scripture. You can preach the paint off the walls. You can have more followers on your social media than all of us. But if there's no power there, if there's no fire shut up in my bones there, if there's no anointing there, if my degrees are present, my accolades are present, my notoriety is present, my gifting is present, but my king and his fire is absent, all I will ever be is impressive but not impactful. All I will ever be is impressive, but not impactful. And I'm not, can't speak for everybody, but I'm not trying to be impressive. I don't want worldly popularity to lift me where a lack of character demotes me. I'm not trying to be impressive. I'm trying to be kingdom. I'm not trying to be impressive. I'm trying to be holy. I'm not trying to be impressive. I'm trying to be Christ-like. I'm not trying to be impressive. I'm trying to be obedient. And it's our obedience that makes us impactful. I need my people to be set on fire. This is what I desire. The fire of the Holy Spirit. This is what my generation needs. The fire of the Holy Spirit. We need to have people once again who are not okay with average mundane Christianity. But I want the fire of God. And I've been praying, God, would you raise up a remnant who want the fire? I want the fire, the all-consuming fire, because once I have fire, you could burn up my greed, and you could burn up my lust, and you could burn up my arrogance, and you could burn up my jealousy, and you could burn up my petty. Help us, Holy Spirit, to rid ourselves from drooling over sewage, <laughs> drooling over garbage, but increase our fire so that we can hunger and thirst after righteousness. Somebody say fire. Matter of fact, I want everybody to say this. I have a fire, have a fire that, can't that can't be quenched. One more time. Put your hand on your chest and say, I have a fire, have a fire that can't be, can't be quenched. That's what's dangerous. That's what the kingdom desires. That's what the world needs. See, the only way you can really be lit is if you have fire from your prayer closet. The world gives you the wrong type of lit. They give you the lit that keeps your fire out. The kingdom gives you a lit that your fire can be sustained. Want to be on fire. So therefore, I must caution you. <laughs> I must give everybody this disclaimer. This series, like this one, it's flammable. <laughs> it's going to cause fires to break out in marriages. It's going to cause fires to break out in your singleness. It's going to cause fires to break out our homes. This one's flammable. And I want to give you some wisdom. Or let me put it in Ebonics vernacular. Let me put you on game. <laughs> because I hear a lot of comments, get DMs, 
And people say things like this, man, ever since I started doing all that Jesus stuff, my life got worse. <laughs> Anybody that ever happened? It seemed like, okay, I like the honest people like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> ever since I started praying, it appears my life got worse. <laughs> ever since I joined that kingdom community, that kingdom church, they preach sound theology over there. I'm better, let's make it personal. Ever since I joined this church, Pastor Flowers, my life got worse. And I want to put you on game real quick, okay? It's dangerous for you to sit under fire, be surrounded by Christians who are on fire, while you're content with just having a spark. Let me explain, because some of y'all don't get it yet. Let me explain. It's dangerous for you to sit under flammable teaching, be surrounded by Christians who are on fire while you're content with having a spark. Because what the enemy will do then is the same level of warfare that hits her, the same level of warfare that hits him, the same level of warfare that hits me is also going to start hitting you because the enemy wants to see, are they made up of the same material? Because he's not omnipresent. He doesn't know all things. Is their prayer life just like that too? Is their fasting just like that too? Is their devotion just like that too? This is why you have to be mindful of your surroundings because the same level of warfare we get, you're going to get hit too. I want to see, do you have the same materials or do they have a spark and okay with it? I don't know why we don't preach this enough. Jesus didn't just get killed and suffered. He wasn't the only one. His followers did too. All these people who are saying, I'm an apostle. Okay. Andrew got crucified. Peter got crucified upside down. James got his head chopped off. Paul said, I got beat three times. I got stoned. In fact, we only preached a part in Acts where we say, and at midnight, there was a great earthquake and all the prison doors were open. Why don't we read Acts chapter 16? Go up to verse 23. You'll see that it says, after many stripes. Why don't we preach that part? After many stripes. What does that mean? They were beaten, flogged then thrown in prison and were still singing praise and worship. You lose your worship when somebody unfollows you. You lose your worship when you get laid off. You lose your worship when somebody breaks up with you. These dudes got beat and were in prison still worshiping. Paul got killed. Nathaniel got skinned alive and then crucified. John was exiled to the island of Patmos. So don't you see in scripture that not only did Jesus suffer, his followers did too. I want to see, are you made up of the same stuff? The same stuff that Tiana's singing about, the same stuff that Tanisha's singing about, the same stuff that he's preaching about. I want to see, are you built with the same material? Or do you have a spark and you're trying to hide it? I need to see that. This is why I try to get us to understand on Therapy Thursday Maybe your life isn't falling apart. It's the old you falling off. The, the, the fire of the Holy Spirit is burning up how you used to respond. You're not falling apart. Your old life is falling off. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get us to understand this series is dangerous because you're going to hear a lot of fire that's designed to set you on fire. So if you're okay with getting a spark, don't act confused when the wind of adversity is a little more intense. Okay, let me, let, me, let me break it down a little more. The second reason on why people say things like, man, ever since I started this Jesus stuff, my life gets worse, it's because I want to get you now while you're manageable. I want to get you now while you're manageable. I made this chart where y'all can see it. There's this fire chart. I believe that fire exist in three phases. You have the match phase, heater phase, uncontrollable fire. So I'm going to give somebody some confirmation. If you find yourself in a place right now in your life where it feels like 
You keep on having wind of adversity after wind of adversity after wind of adversity. It's possibly a sign that you're at the match phase. Why? Because the enemy's like, okay, they're coming. They're hearing this new series, Firefighters. They got on fire from that word. <sighs> wind of adversity, I got to blow that out. They thought they were going to be on fire from that word. I got to blow that out quick. You come to the men's conference, and then you know how y'all shouted, wait a minute, roo, roo. When I ask that next Sunday, wait a minute, yeah, they're going to be all fired up. Like, all right, you on fire from that encounter? Okay, <sighs> lay off. Lay off. They're at the match phase. And every wind of adversity, you thought 2024, you're going to read the whole Bible this year. <laughs> That's your goal. I'm going to read all the Bible. This year. So you start reading your Bible off. January the 3rd. <sighs> Break up. <laughs> Somebody say, you thought. <laughs> You're manageable here. I can maintain you while you have a spark. I, I can blow it out once you haven't matured yet. So if you find yourself where your life is just like, it's not that you're doing nothing wrong. It's that you keep on getting set on fire. And the enemy is trying to stop it before you mature. Bible all day. What happened once Jesus was born? There was massive genocide. Because the enemy comes to kill, steal, destroy. Kill all two-year-old male babies. I don't know where the king is, but I don't want him to become one. So let me kill it in its infancy. So that it never transitions to a heater or to uncontrollable fire. This is so good, y'all. Now look, the heater, you're connected to the source of power. That's why you're hot. Heaters make you warm. You talk to somebody at Walmart, yeah, I love the Lord. You're a heater. They're going to they gonna feel your warmth. Yeah, they're they going to feel it. And wind doesn't affect heaters. It's still hot. Because you're connected to fire. But watch this. At the heater phase, you only have the potential of producing a fire. It takes for you to get pushed. This is how there have been apartment fires, fires in a warehouse, because a heater was a little too close to something, and then it produced a fire. There was a heater that got pushed over, and since it got pushed, it produced fire. I'm praying that this word pushes all heaters under the sound of my voice, pushes you to produce fire in your job and produce fire in your life. You have the potential. You just need to get pushed. And as I was researching this, now we have safety precautions with certain heaters. If it falls over, it turns off, cuts off immediately. You know what that's like? You come to small group, somebody holds you accountable. That was a push, but instead of you producing a fire, you got cut off. I'm church hurt. I'm done. I'm done. I, don't be the type of person where when God's trying to produce you to make fire, you stop fire because of offense. Because of offense. It's not that the person said something offensive. It's that your flesh was offended. But your spirit's like, we need this. We need this to grow. The heaters, you just need a push. That's it. That's why small group is so important for you. You're not a match anymore. You're a heater. You just need somebody to push you though. Now, the uncontrollable fire... This is what the enemy never wants you to get to. Because the uncontrollable fire is not controlled by life. It's not controlled by circumstances. It's not controlled by bad news. I'm going to burn because the fire of the Holy Spirit has done a work in my heart. I want you to see an image of what uncontrollable fire looks like. When there's uncontrollable fire that's burning through a forest, that's burning through the woods. Watch this. Wind actually helps it. Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. You missed it because remember... At the match phase, if you get set on fire and there's wind, you get blown out. At the uncontrollable phase, if there's wind, that makes me spread. 
That makes me burn more. I grow from stuff like this. Keep talking about me. I become from stuff like this. Keep on kind of confronting me. I grow from stuff like this, and the wind of adversity doesn't stop us. It makes us grow stronger. I go harder once I'm persecuted. I go harder once I hear negative reports. I go harder once we get bad reports about parking, and if you park here, they're going to tow your stuff. I'm like, God, what are we going to? Hold on. I'm going to keep on preaching the gospel. I'm not going to allow a situation to affect my uncontrollable fire. The enemy wants your situation to control your fire, but God is saying, I want you to have a fire that can't be quenched. Somebody say fire. Fire. So all throughout this series, you're going to hear me say fire and firefighters. I want to give you definitions of what this means, okay? This is why I can't be up here preaching sugar. I can't be up here preaching feel-good messages. That doesn't produce fire. I can't reword scripture to grow a social media presence. That doesn't produce followers. That doesn't produce fire. That just produces followers. And I don't need more followers. I need to be a follower of Jesus myself. This is why we have to preach sound theology accurately. Somebody say right. Right. Because hear me, right prescriptions cure problems, but wrong prescriptions cause them. This is so good, y'all. Same Bible somebody's fighting over right now. Right prescriptions cure problems. Wrong ones can cause them. So what do I mean by fire? I'm going to say it like twice so that we can get it because it's kind of a lot. What does it mean to be on fire? To be on fire, this means you pursue the things of God, love the things of God, repent from what's not like God, and in all areas, I strive to represent the kingdom of God. One more time, what does it mean to be on fire? To be on fire means I'm pursuing the things of God. I love the things of God. I'm repenting from what's not like God, and in all areas, I strive to represent the kingdom of God. That's fire. So if you want to have a, like a measurement, am I on fire? Do you love the things of God? Yeah, I love them. Okay, so you're pursuing the things of God then. Okay, yeah, I'm pursuing them. All right, and you're repenting from the things that is not like God, and in every area, you're striving. You won't be perfect, but you will be progressive. I'm striving in all areas to represent the kingdom of God. At HEB, I'm representing the kingdom of God. That person who cut me off on 290 when I was about to say something, I'm representing the kingdom of God. Somebody's a little too loud, I'm representing the kingdom of God. They came at you at 100, you're not like, okay, um, you messed with the wrong one. (laughs) Some of us are like, okay, I'm trying to serve in the ministry, so I'm helping with the parking lot. And somebody drove by. This happened last Sunday. Somebody drove by when we tried to give them instructions where to park. They flipped off a volunteer. I'm just so thankful our volunteer wasn't like, stop, get on time. Okay, hold up. (laughs) Like, where you think you coming to, the club? True story. Will you not allow sin against you to produce sin in you? uncontrollable fire. Pursue the things of God, love the things of God, repent from what's not like God, and in all areas I'm striving to represent the kingdom of God. Now, what is a firefighter? A firefighter is any and everything that encourages, influences, or causes broken intimacy with Jesus. What is a firefighter? It's any and everything that encourages, influences, or causes broken intimacy with Jesus. And hold up, before you think this is somebody else, consider it might be me. It's getting quiet in here on the day. Because we always think the counterfeit is them. We always think the firefighter is them. I promise you, there, I promise you, if you're never wrong, something is wrong. Like you never missed it? (laughs) You never were a firefighter? I've always been holy. (laughs) 
I want us to, to speak this over our life. Can I get us to say this and everybody watching online, can you put this in the room in all caps? Father, Father set, my heart on fire set my heart on fire and consume, and consume any, and any and everything that's not like you. Not like you. One more time. Father, Father set, my set my heart on fire and consume, and consume any, and any and everything that's not like you. Yeah. You want to grow, right? You want to be buff in the spirit? Allow the Holy Spirit to give you some fire. Fire. For the next several weeks, we're going to be parked right here in this fire fighter series. And the Holy Spirit has us here for three reasons. Number one, you cannot have lukewarm faith in a hellish season. I'm telling you prophetically, due to what's about to come on the land in the next few months and years, the lukewarm will be forced to decide. Are you going to be hot or not? Are you going to be sold out or not? Are you going to be faithful or not? Are you going to be committed or not? Because trials have a way of exposing those who are interested from those who are committed. <laughs> And every, please hear me, every drifting Christian starts as a prayerless one. Every drifting Christian starts as a prayerless one. I'm trying so hard to get my generation to understand fire doesn't come from stages. It comes from closets. It's not in the platform. It's not in the stage. It's not in the endorsement. It's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 6. Don't be like the hypocrites who pray in public long, lofty prayers to be seen by men. They have reaped their reward in full. But when you pray, you go to your room, you close the door, you get in that secret place. And the Father who sees in secret, he will reward you in public. Power's in your closet. It's not up here. It's not in the rays. It's in your closet. God doesn't care about your public betrayal if you keep on having private betrayal. Really, he doesn't care about PDA. God is not big on PDA if you don't have closet life. Your public display of affection and crying. What do you like Sunday night? What do you like Monday? What do you like Tuesday? Oh, it's small group, so now you're holy. What do you like Thursday? I want, I want... You to seek my face in the closet, in those secret places where we could dwell with one another. The kingdom is looking for people who have faith who is resilient. I'm talking about hard-headed faith. Faith that knows how to talk back. Faith that has a clap back to it. This isn't going to discourage me. It's going to make me pray harder. This isn't going to push me away. It's going to make me pray harder. This isn't going to make me doubt. It's going to make me seek his face more. I'm talking about hard-headed, stubborn faith that does not quit, that will believe when everything around you is telling you doubt. I'm not letting the wind of a sideways comment cause me to step out of character. I abide by Proverbs chapter 19, verse 11. It's my glory to overlook an offense. Some of us ain't there yet. I know. Keep coming. When the text says it's one's glory... To overlook, somebody say overlook. overlook. One definition of overlook means to see from above. I'm overlooking the valley from the hill. So when you're able to overlook an offense, I'm above that. <laughs> That's level four. I'm up here level 20. I'm above that. I need my people to be on fire because difficulty and satanic assaults, assaults will always expose those who have a flame and those who have a spark. 2020 revealed it. It was a year of a massive exodus from churches and from faith or a massive influx to faith because hardship and difficulty will expose those who have a flame versus those who have a spark. That's the first reason. The second reason why the Holy Spirit has us doing this series is because it's going to be hard for you to burn for God while you're dating a fire extinguisher. Now y'all should see y'all face. <laughs> Why your habits are a fire extinguisher. Could it be your problem is 
Your type is firefighters. <laughs> you like the things, because remember, what is a firefighter? It's any and everything that encourages, influences, or causes broken intimacy with Jesus. So you don't cry until you did it. Like, I'm like, when does conviction kick in? While you're driving over there or after you're sitting on the edge of the bed? When does it kick in? I'm not sorry. My generation requires real. So you heard his voice after. Because I think about me the whole way while you trying. Turn around. What you doing? Boy, you, where we get this soft whisper from? Mine's not soft and quiet. Don't say nothing. Don't do that. Be quiet. You need to say something. When do you hear? After? Somebody said the whole way. <laughs> I heard you. <laughs> we all been there. No judgment. So listen, what I'm trying to simply say is those that don't love and serve the Lord won't assist you in loving and serving the Lord. They won't. If they don't love and serve him, what makes you think? They're going to assist you in loving and serving the Lord. Firefighters. Firefighters. The third reason the Holy Spirit has us doing this series is because God wants to ignite our hearts to burn for him again. I'm talking about that romance phase. I don't know. Maybe everybody's Christian journey was different. But when I got saved, like, for real, for real, I was excited about it. It was like the honeymoon phase. I'm wearing Christian apparel and t-shirt seriously I'm in college with shirts on and then when I really got saved like Tim Tebow was playing football and he was thanking God we have Steph Curry with all things Christ who shrinks me on a shoe I'm like yeah it's cool to be a Christian yeah you going to the club no I'm going to Bible study <laughs> I was like saved and boasting in it and then somewhere down the line you recognize sometimes following Jesus can cause for you to be alone. Yes. None, none of my friends trying to do this? All of y'all going over there? Everybody going to the point. Everybody going to Mardi Gras. Like, all of y'all. We got a men's conference around then. Y'all want to come? No, we're going to Mardi Gras. So I, I, I found myself discovering rather quickly Christianity is cool until you suffer. Yes. Till I lost friends, until my phone got so dry, I'm playing with the settings. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't no need to look at your notifications. Nobody hit you up. Nobody calling you. I got two happy new years this year. <laughs> I'm telling the truth. Oh, what, what ringtone they got this time? Oh, they got a new text tone. Like, so dry, you playing with sentence. <laughs> Am I telling the truth? Yes. And I, I didn't recognize that it was actually God preserving me. Yes. You see, because the same way I was showing us that match phase, if I could put you away from no wind, you burn a little longer. And not as long as I want you to, but that sure is a whole lot faster than <laughs> Maybe God is saying, you're too impressionable right now because you dim your light for your parents. You dim your light for your coworkers. So I need to remove anything that will be a firefighter right now. Until you become uncontrollably burning with fire. I need to protect you. And I recognized when God calls a man or calls a woman to burn, he wants to give you an unquenchable fire. Paul has just gone through this shipwreck. They land on this island. And I'm thinking, like, he really went as a prisoner. There were prisoners on the ship. Y'all should read it. Acts chapter 28. There were prisoners on the ship. We land on this island. I probably would have ran. <laughs> Just knowing I'm trying to get away. Y'all brought me here as a captive. I want to get away. He's helping. 
goes to get these sticks and has no idea he's carrying a snake. Wrote almost half of the New Testament. Doesn't recognize there's a snake in this until it's on fire. And this is the, the, the amazing part about this. Once he put it down, the snake, usually snakes are like this, boom. The Bible says it fastened itself to his hand. And he throws it in the fire. And as I was in the study, I said, oh, man, that's so powerful. You fight the enemy back by making him burn up by your fire. Don't get petty back. Put it in fire. When people do evil to you, you do right to them. Why? That's like putting hot coals on their head. So I'm trying to get you to understand you don't fight fire with pity. You fight fire with fire. But the fire of the Holy Spirit, I'm like, okay, I get it. This is why the enemy doesn't want our homes on fire. Because fire exposes snakes. This is why he doesn't want your prayer life on fire. Because fire exposes snakes. This is why he doesn't want your, your, your household and your job to be on fire and you have any influence on Because fire exposes snakes. And then I begin to think, hmm, just like I told us last Sunday, any competitive sport, you study your adversary so that you can learn how to beat them. So I begin to think, man, if I was the devil, if I was the devil, I would make there be so much division in church. Matter of fact, let's give them denominations. I would cause for there to be division in church so that they would never complete each other. They would compete with each other. That's what I would do if I was the devil because if the church is on fire, fire exposes snakes. Okay, I get it, I get it, I get it, okay. If, if, if I was the devil, to whoever's practicing being celibate and you're waiting to marriage, I would send a fine man your way. I would send a fine woman your way who's talking right responding right, DMs seem to be lining up, IG seems to be lining up. I would try to confuse God's voice with my voice so that you'll end up calling a red flag God's blessing. That's what I would do if I were the devil because I recognize that fire exposes snakes. If I was the devil, I would try to make the wrong voice the most popular so that the church could be the sugar of the earth and not the salt of the earth. That's what I would do if I was a devil. I wouldn't want them to be on fire because I know that fire exposes snakes. If I was a devil, I would make every worshiper be caught up with their stage, with their views, with their Spotify streams versus their closet. Because I know that true power and true fire comes from your prayer closet. That's what I would do if I was a devil because I know that fire exposes snakes. If I was a devil to that couple that just had a huge argument, bro, I'm going to make that secretary so flirty tomorrow. I'm going to make her tell you all the stuff you want your wife to tell you. I'm going to want her to compliment your fragrance and your, your workout and your, all your stuff. I'm going to want her to compliment all of that because Delilah knows how to speak to Samson, but she's after his strength. That's what I would do. I hate covenants. I hate godly mar marriages. I'm the one who offered hotaffairs.com. I want to sever everything that's supposed to represent kingdom in the earth. That's what I would do. I don't want their marriage on fire because I know that fire exposes snakes. If I was the devil, I would make people think God doesn't exist. So they'll spend their whole life looking for peace and comfort, but will never find it because they don't believe in the one that gives peace and comfort. That's what I would do because I know fire exposes snakes. If I was a devil, I would sexually confuse society. And I would have perversion be in every household I could get it in so that dysfunction could be the norm. Oh yeah, same sex sin, that would be my pilot. Promiscuity, that would be my flight crew. And I would fly a generation down at deadly altitudes. That's what I would do. 
if I was a devil because I recognize that fire exposes snakes and I'm going to preach with everything I got to try to get a fire to burn in somebody's heart, to try to get a fire to burn in somebody's soul. Well, you don't want the club anymore. You don't want alcohol anymore. You don't want weed anymore. You don't want to have sex with them anymore. You don't want to get high anymore. I used to, but I want a fire now. I want the power of the Holy Spirit. I want the power of the Holy Ghost. I need you to feel me somebody say fire. fire that's what the church needs is the fire of God not jokes not entertainment not games not giveaway we need fire, fire. that lasts not just when I say amen and go home but you're still burning and taking the fire with you because fire exposes snakes I wonder What's your log? What's that thing in your life that you're carrying that the enemy's in and you don't know it because it's not burning? What's that log you carry every day and you have no idea the enemy's hiding in here somewhere? And he can do it. And it don't matter how much you read and how much Paul is anointed and doesn't know it. This is natural, but I believe it has a spiritual point. It's possible that you're carrying things that the enemy is hiding behind. And the only way you can recognize that Satan has some stronghold is if you get on fire. That's what, that's what God is looking for. A people who will burn again. So I want to give you some points on how. We get on fire, and then we're free to go home and stay warm for this Arctic invasion that's coming. (laughs) As I was reading this text, here's just a little um, Bible study wisdom. Before you ever preach a scripture or share a scripture, read three chapters in front of it and three chapters behind it so that you can get the accurate context. And depending on what particular book you're reading, you might need to read the whole chapter and the whole book before you just try to preach that one verse. Because looking at this verse, I was wondering, why didn't Paul trip? This is a viper. Those are venomous. Why wasn't he like, oh, man, hey, y'all got some, y'all got some anti-venom? He just threw it off. But if you read the verse, read the chapter before, Acts 27 Verse 23, Paul was speaking to them, and he said, listen, last night an angel of the, angel of the Lord, to whom I belong and whom I serve, stood beside me and said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So the reason Paul was able to know this serpent ain't going to kill me, is because God already told him, you got to get to Caesar. (laughs) See, when you spend time with God, what happens in June of this year ain't going to bother you because you already got your word and confirmation in January of this year. So you're able to like, this ain't going to phase me. I got to stand before Caesar. And the text says that everybody on board was saved because Paul was on it. This is why every time I get on an aircraft, when Torrance is with me, I say, everybody's safe because we on it. Death must respect my purpose. I got to get to wherever God is telling me to go to. Whenever God brings a man far, it's because of a people he's trying to bring near. Our plane not going to crash. We're going to get there. Stop being afraid to fly. If you have an assignment that God is telling you to go do, death must respect your purpose. So how do you, how do you stay hot? Number one, it's ignited by intimacy. Ignited by intimacy. So then the question becomes, because I don't want to assume all of us know what I mean by spiritual intimacy. Some people, you think intimacy, you immediately think sex. (laughs) I want us to understand, it's quality time, you and the Lord. Not your leftover strength. This is why you fall asleep when you read the Bible. Because you try to read it after work. (laughs) Y'all should see y'all face. Seriously, you keep giving God your leftover strength, but you want first fruit blessings. Seek him first. Not your phone, not Instagram. Before you read the notification, 
before you gather the kids, wake up a little earlier where you can give him the intimacy into me. See? Intimacy. It's ignited by your prayer. And remember, it's discipline. Just like for those of us who are fasting. Hope I'm not the only one up here. This, all right. For those of us who are fasting, it's discipline until it becomes desire. Can I share something with y'all personal? This is not in my notes. It's just personal. Can I share something with y'all personal? Yeah. After last Sunday, seeing how many people came and how many people we couldn't fit in and every overflow and all part, I thank God for what he's doing. But when I was praying to God, I felt a little burden. I don't ever want anybody to leave because it's so crowded. You know, this is my heart. And the Holy Spirit clearly said to me, either you don't believe me are you not reading the Bible enough? <laughs> what, is, what does that mean? You don't know how to identify a glory setup? It's always impossible before it ever becomes miracle. I have to allow you to go in a lion's den because then the impossible gets them miracle. I have to allow Pharaoh to come behind you and Red Sea in front of you. Can't you identify glory setups? I'm about to do something that nobody can get the credit but me. It has to be so tough. It has to look so daunting. It has to look so bad where you'll be able to say, ain't no way this happened outside of God. God did this. It's a glory set up. But what if I didn't pray? I'd have just walked around bothered. But through prayer, I said, son, I need you to identify glory setups. It has to seem impossible before it ever becomes miracle. Because then that's how I can step in and get glory. If it's possible, you don't need a miracle. So I'm like, okay, well, do the impossible then. <laughs> Ignited by intimacy. Number two, how do you stay hot? Fan the flame with intentionality. Fan the flame with intentionality. That's simple. It's cold today. They're saying it's probably going to be freezing, rain, and ice. You still came, but you're probably going to get home quick. But you still came. That's intentional. May not like it, but I'm intentional. The same way your butt was intentional to go to the club when it was cold and you still had the, the whole split open, not worrying about the conditions, you still, I'm telling the truth, you didn't care if it was cold. All you knew was I'm going to the club tonight. Same with brothers, you didn't care that you had to go to work. If a shorty was talking about it, it don't matter, you were talking to her. It's getting quiet, I'm trying to be real, you didn't care. Keep that same energy when it comes to your intentionality with God. Second Timothy chapter one, verse six, for this reason I remind you to fan into the flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. You fan the flame. How do you do that? Number three, surround yourself with community. I gotta be surrounded by, like, we don't even have the heat on in here. If we had the heat on in here, it would be super hot. I know somebody watching passed away. You sweating. It looked like the heat. <laughs> if we had the heat on, we would all be hot. You know why? Because, all, because of all of the body heat. Oh, that's probably a whole sermon. I need to probably do that. A sermon called body heat. <laughs> you're warm because you're just a part of the body. Body heat. You would be cold solo for everybody who's like, I'm good by myself. Okay, stay over there by yourself. But when you're surrounded by body heat, you're kept warm by other people in the body. Number four, rest frequently. How do you stay on fire? You got to rest. This is how you experience being burned out. You rest. Number five is so good, y'all. And the only way I knew this is because when I graduated from college, became certified to be a teacher, nobody hired me. I had all the credentials. I was like, you know, I'm going to be a firefighter. 
They work two days a week. My job never gonna be born as a firefighter. 40 hours a week, 24 hour shifts at the firehouse and be a firefighter. So I was studying, looking up all of this information to take the test to get in the fire academy. And I learned this, this term that I never knew and it's loaded with preaching potential. It's called a prescribed burn. A prescribed burn. Or what they call a controlled burn. A prescribed burn is when you set a fire on purpose. Research it, okay. When there are wildfires in California, one of the ways that they fight fires is by a prescribed burn. They go before the fire and on purpose they set a fire so that they burned up all of the fuel so that by the time the wildfire gets there, there's no fuel for it to be contained. So they go before the fire and burn everything up first on purpose so that when the fires of this life try to come and affect my faith, I'm already on fire. My pride already been burned up. My arrogance has already been burned up. My lust has already been burned up. So the temptation doesn't hit as harder when I've already set a fire on purpose. And what God is trying to get us to understand is some temptations hit harder because you don't have a fire yourself. But if I can prescribe a burn, if I can prescribe a fire in your heart, by the time the fire of culture hits you, everything that would burn you up is already being burned up with my power. It's being burned up with my grace. It's being burned up with my anointing. It's being burned up with my favor. Let me burn you first. So you won't be crying when they burn you second. Did y'all hear what I just said? Let me burn you first. So you won't be tripping when they burn you second. Let me get to it first. Let me get to your cravings first. Let me get to your appetite first. Let me get to your longings first. Let me get to your desires first. Let me get to your mind first. Let me get to your vision first. Let me get to your perspective first. So that when it comes, I'm already burning on fire for Jesus. Prescribed burn. It's when you intentionally set a fire to have fire management of what's coming. God, in this moment, prescribe a burn fire. We're asking God, burn up everything in our life that's not like you. And we're also asking God, give us spiritual discernment to number one, be able to identify what are we caring that a snake is in? And we don't know it because we have a spark. And secondly, give us discernment to identify the firefighters in our life. It could be a show, a website that you keep going to that you have to clear the history on every night. It could be that vibrator in the drawer. Whatever firefighter. It doesn't have to be a person. It could be a thing. Give us the wisdom to see it for what it is. And also, God, help us to have introspection where we could see, am I a firefighter? Am I not helping others burn for Christ? But I'm contributing to brokenness? If so, God, convict me and help me to change. Conviction is not condemnation. It's simply your way of saying, I love you. And there's a whole nother level that I want to take you to. Turn from that. Not just remorse, but repentance. Turn from that. So we could be on fire for you. And God, I also pray that this was confirmation for somebody. Oh, that's what this is. This is a prescribed burn. God is setting my heart on fire so that I could withstand the fires of this world. Thank you, Lord, for keeping us lit. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody who agrees with that prayer would just say amen all over the building. You could do better than that. Would this bless somebody?